Now this has been announced several times now. So anybody that's still here, you, you're getting what's coming to you. You had every, you had every way out. You had, you had every opportunity. We're going to be in the book of Genesis tonight. Genesis chapter 6. And uh, I don't know if any, many of you may not know the evangelist by the name of Charlie Tenney. But he told a story one time. He was at a preacher's meeting and uh, this preacher got up. And uh, he, man, he just preached this message. And it was, oh, it was deep. It was complex. And man, he really just, he really just studied and got, got the meat out of the Word. And this other preacher got up after him at this preacher meeting and he said, man, that was deep, 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 deep. But he said, brother, if you're going to get that deep, you better bring up some water. And so tonight, we're going to try to bring up some water. But we ain't going very deep. <laughs> some of you already knew that. <laughs> All right, Genesis chapter 6. We're going to read the whole chapter, so bear with me. Um, it's crucial to the text tonight that we understand, um, we understand this passage in its entirety. So we'll begin reading in verse 1. It says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the, in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, <clears throat> the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before the Lord, before God. And the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. And for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, the breadth of it fifty cubits, and the height of it thirty cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy it, all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. With, but with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female." of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee, shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take, thee unto, and take thou unto thee all of the food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this opportunity to preach your word, and God, I pray that you would only use me as a mouthpiece now, and I pray that you would um, prepare hearts to receive your word, and that I would only speak what you want said tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. So, very familiar story to all of us in here, I would say, uh, Wednesday night crowd, I think I can make that assumption. Um, but this, this story kind of picks up. We, we have Adam and Eve, and we have Cain and Abel. And then the Bible goes into just listing a little bit of genealogy. It's a little bit of, um, you know, and so-and-so begets so-and-so. And it goes on and on. And that's the part of your Bible reading every day that always gets me. Uh, and some of it's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And every verse is the same. 
And, and, and I think it's really easy to kind of get in cruise control when you're reading through those passages. But the truth is, those, are, those things are all very important because it's important for us to understand that lineage. And that's put in there so that we can, we can see the prophecy of God fulfilled later on. So we get, we get past the genealogy and we get to this chapter. And it's been several hundred years now since the, since the earth was created and man has had time to multiply and, and, and do those things. And things are not going quite according to what would be pleasing to God. And, and things, have, things have took a turn. And I, and I, I read this and I, and I thought how, 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 it must have, how it must have grieved God, but at the same time, the love that He was expressing through that grief. And, and what I came to was the fact that God created man with a free will. Nobody told God he had to do that. Nobody forced God. Nobody said, hey, God, it'd be a good idea if you did this. He created man of a free will, all the while being omnipotent and omniscient, knowing that this would come, and yet he still created us. But he, he comes to this place where he's, he's talking about, he's looking at all this, and he said it's, it's corrupt, it's awful, it's wicked. In fact, he goes as far as to say the the imaginations of men were only evil continually. Now, if you're in my uh, junior church class on Sundays, you know that we have been looking at Noah um, in depth, at least as in depth as I know how to go, which is probably as in depth as they can receive. So we've been looking at Noah in, in depth and picking it apart and really taking our time to understand this, this Bible story that we have here because there's a lot of really interesting stuff. There's a lot of good stuff that God has put in here for us. And I think the, the, the enormity and the, the publicity of this story, a lot of these details that God intended for us to get can be overlooked easily. And so I was looking at it and I thought the imaginations of men was only evil continually. And I really dwelled on that and really thought about it and I thought, how how dark of a world must it have been? How, how awful must it have been? I thought to myself, I thought, okay, our world's pretty dark today. It would be pretty easy for us to say, oh man, the world is, oh, it's so drab. It's just people are so mean. Crime is raising. Springfield was, what we, was, we heard, top five violent crimes. Man, things around us are just, they're just dark. They're just dark times. And I thought to myself, they are pretty dark. But at the same time, we still get reports of people doing nice things. We still hear about, you know, people going out of their way. And, and you know, there's still, there's still churches that are, that are preaching the gospel. We still, we still get reports from our missionaries of people getting saved. And people, you know, surrendering to full-time ministry. And I thought, it's pretty dark, but God's still blessing. God's still present. I don't think we could, we could sit here in our honesty and say that the earth... And that man is, their thoughts are only evil continually, even as dark as our world may seem. I don't think that we would fit that. So I'm not really sure that we can fully identify with how dark the world would have been and how gross it would have been. And I think God gives us some inclination here because he said here, he said, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Now, let's not, we're just going to pause here and cover something important. Whenever, whenever, I think it's really easy for us to, to sort of try to identify with that, whenever it says it grieved him at his heart, we're not talking about his blood pumping muscle. We're talking about the seed of his emotions. We're talking about the feelings. These are things that we really can't even grasp with our mind because God is so much, so, so high above us. It would have grieved him on a level that we can't imagine. And so it grieved him at his heart. And so he, he decides, he says, I'm going to destroy man completely. I'm going to destroy all the creeping things. I'm going to destroy it all. But then verse 11, if you'll notice the distinction here God makes, he says, the earth, was also, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So this starts off as a man is corrupt, man is wicked, they have done sinful things, they have done awful things, I'm going to destroy man. But then we read down a few verses and God said, you know what? I'm going to destroy the whole earth. I'm going to destroy all of it. Not just the men, not just the things that I've created. I'm going to destroy the very earth. And I thought to myself, I thought, well, 
Why would he destroy the earth? Why would he make the distinction between man and the earth? And if you read on in a few chapters, he covers, the, he covers um, after they get off of the ark. Spoiler alert, they live. I don't know if everybody knew that. After they get off the ark, they, he, he puts fear and he puts dread between man and the animals. And so that was not the case prior to the flood. Now, I thought this is probably beneficial for several reasons, but one, it probably made the animals a little bit easier to get on the ark. Now, that was obviously God helping, but there would, there would have been some, some, uh, some benefits to animals not having the same fear that they have of us today. But I thought to myself, this bond between men and animals would more than likely would have been a lot closer. It would have been a lot closer. And I thought, no wonder there, that God, God said, I'm going to destroy it all. He didn't just come to a point and say, Boy, man's really bad, but I think I can salvage the, you know, we'll just get rid of man and that'll, the, earth will, the earth will come back. That wasn't sufficient. So he says, I'm going to destroy it all. It's all going to go away. But verse 8, and this is, this is one of the greatest verses in the Bible, and if you don't believe me, we can talk about it after, but it says, verse 8, it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is pivotal by the way, for the entire survival of mankind and life as we know it, if this verse is not in the Bible, then we can forget about it. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And I thought it's interesting that God picked the word grace here because he goes on to tell us that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. And I thought to myself, I thought, well, if, if, why would God choose the word grace? If Noah's a just man, if Noah's a perfect man, if he's, if he's upright in his generation, he's a man of righteousness. Now, that's not to say that Noah was actually sinless. There's only been one person to be, live, the, live their life sinless. That's Jesus Christ. But it says that he was perfect. That means he was complete in his generation. And I thought, well, why would God use the word grace? Because if we think about what the word grace means, grace is unmerited favor. Grace is something that you get that you don't deserve. I thought, well, why wouldn't God have used the word mercy? Mercy seems more fitting. If Noah was a just man, if Noah was a perfect man, Noah, Noah did all the right things, right? Then he should have deserved mercy. Because mercy carries with it the idea that you don't get something you do deserve. And so there's a, there's a really interesting distinction. But God chose the word grace. And as I was studying, I thought, that's really interesting. We're going to come back to that. But verses, verse number 8, like I said, this is one of the most important verses in the Bible. It says, but, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It says, God's talking about it here, verse 7, He says, The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. There's so many instances in the Bible where God puts a but. He'll go on, he'll, 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 he'll have a section where he's talking about sin or condemnation or, or death or the penalties or justice. And then there's one of those verses in there. But. One of my favorites is over in Romans. It's going on, he's talking about how, how hard it would be for, for a person to die for even a righteous man. In Romans 5, verse 7, Romans chapter 5, verse 7, he's talking about how hard it would be for even, even it, would be, it would be difficult for someone to want to die for even a just man. And then it goes on in verse 8, it says, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, we weren't good people. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So when you see a but in the Scripture, it's very important to take a look at it because usually there's something good in there for us. And there's something that we take advantage of every day in our life. So looking at this idea of Noah found, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, Noah needed grace for several reasons. Because while Noah would have been a just man, an upright man, a perfect man, he, he, was, he was all these things, one thing that Noah still was guilty of is he was still a sinner. He had still done things that were wrong. He had still messed up. So while we can, we can look at Noah, we can see how the Bible says he was just, he was perfect, he did the right things, he was still a sinner. 
He still deserved everything else that every person on the earth was going to get. He still deserved all of it. In fact, the Bible, the Bible tells us that, the, 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 he's, that God was going to establish a covenant with him later on here. But the fact is, he didn't deserve that. He didn't deserve any of it. In fact, what he deserved, he deserved to be killed with everybody else. He deserved to be wiped out. He didn't deserve to be spared. He didn't deserve to be spared in let alone such a miraculous way and given, given such a, a, a task at hand to care for all these animals that God had and preserve life as we know it. He didn't deserve that. As we read on over in verse 17 of this same chapter, it says, Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. That sounds pretty ominous. That sounds pretty serious. There's verse 18. And what's that word? But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. He made provision for Noah. He gave Noah a gift that was free. There's another verse that we look at over in Romans, and it's in 6, 6 verse 23, and it says, For the wages of sin is death. Again, pretty hard-hitting first half of that verse. But the second part of that verse is, But God, or I'm sorry, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It didn't end there. And it didn't end there for Noah. And I thought to myself how we can look at Noah and we can see all this, this, this amazing things that transpired and we can, we can even identify with Noah in certain aspects because we were all granted a similar salvation because the ark is, is a picture of salvation. It's a picture of what would be of things to come. And we see that. And, and we can be recipients of this same gift, this same grace that Noah found in the eyes of God. You could put your name in there and you could say, but Owen found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Owen was born a sinner. Owen didn't deserve anything except hell when he died. Owen messed up. But Owen found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's nothing Owen did. That's nothing anything that he could have done of himself. It was only through the provision of God that any of us could find grace. But God gave us grace free. And the Bible talks about how, how where sin did abound, grace did abound more. And I probably butchered that. You'll have to forgive me for that. But the context there is that it doesn't matter how dark a world we live in. If the grace of God was sufficient to save Noah from a world that we can't even imagine how dark and gloomy it was, it's more than sufficient still today. The grace of God has no expiration date. And so, as I'm looking at this, I think, okay, that's pretty, that's pretty simple. That's pretty easy. A lot of us in here have accepted that gift, that grace. We would say we're recipients of it. Well, the thing about this, this account here is it doesn't just end with salvation. You see, because while it took faith for Noah to get on the ark, to trust in God, to follow through with that, it was more than that. Because keep in mind, we read the, we read the instructions. We read the instructions for what, what the ark would consist of, what it would look like, how big it would be. But not one part in there do we see anything about sails. Do we see anything about any means of propulsion? That's a big word for me, but it means something that, that moved the boat through the water, that moved the ark through the water, rather. And we didn't see anything in there about the captain's quarters or the helm. Back in VBS, we had a great time with VBS this last year. I didn't get to participate in VBS exactly because God had other plans, but... I got to help with a lot of the decorations, and I had a great time. We had, for those of you that were here, we had a giant ship up here on the, on the platform. I almost called it a stage. <laughs> on the platform. And so we had it up here, and, and there, was, there was the helm, there was the sails, and it was really cool, and the kids got engaged with it, and it was great. But the ark looked nothing like that. Because the thing is, when Noah got on the ark, and God shut the door... Nothing else really mattered. 
He made the decision, Noah made the decision to follow God. We read the last verse, it says, And all that God told him, Noah did according. He did it all. And Noah gets onto the ark. He gets on with his family. He led by example. He got on there. And then it was just a matter of waiting. In excess of 150 days they spent on the ark. They didn't have one window in the top, which probably wasn't much to look at. But you know what? It looked in the direction that they needed to. And that was by design. It said in the, in, the, in, the, in the above shalt thou finish it. Finish it above. And so as they're in this ark, I thought to myself, I thought, uh-uh. No, that would not work for me. That would not work for me at all. When I go on a trip, I like to drive. When I'm doing something, I like to be in control. I like, to, I like to call the shots. And that's both negative and positive all, in the same, all at the same time. But I like to be in control. And I think a lot of us in here could probably identify with aspects of that. Maybe not to my extreme, but that's between me and God. And so we could identify with certain aspects of that. We like to be in control. And I thought to myself, I don't know that I would want to just go get on a boat and nobody's steering. Nobody's got any sort of, nobody's got a windshield to look at. Nobody's got anything to, to check. Nobody's checking a monitor or a radar or anything to see where we're going so we don't run aground or hit something. You're just in there. You're just in there trusting God. And I thought to myself, how many of us are trying to drive still? How many of us are still in control? Because it's real easy to want to drive. It's real easy to want to get in control. But here's the thing. We said before, the ark is a picture. The ark is a picture of salvation. Noah didn't have a steering wheel. Noah was fully relying on God. He didn't have anything else. He didn't have any of the other stuff. I thought to myself, I thought, man, if I'm, if I'm Noah, and I'm building this ark, and God comes to, verse, he comes to chapter 7, and he said, all right, Noah, it's time to get on the ark, get your family, get things in order, it's time, let's do it. I'm the kind of guy that would be out there saying, wait, 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 hold on, i got to learn one more thing, God, I'm just going to repitch this area over here. Shim was doing it, and he was just kind of doing a crummy job, I think he was sleeping. I'm, I'm just going to re-hit that real quick, we'll let that dry, and then we'll get underway. All right, we're just going to, we're just going to, I just want to check everything over one more time. You know, you haven't really told me how long I'm going to be on here, so I'm just trying to cover all the bases, you know, do a good job following instructions. It's not in there. It's not in there, and it's not our place to go adding things to the Word of God that aren't in there. We can't, we can't armchair quarterback the Bible. We can't say, well, I mean, this probably happened. No, it's not in there. God didn't put it in there for a reason. And what we do have is we have instructions of a vessel that to, by today's standards would not be very seaworthy. But the fact is, all that, all that mattered in this whole thing was that God, that Noah put his complete faith and his complete trust in God. So the message is this tonight. Number one, if you haven't accepted the grace of God, if you haven't, if you haven't taken that gift that God has given, get on the boat! Get on the ark. You can accept it. It's free. The tickets are still being handed out. Your sin will get you nothing but death and destruction. If you don't, if you don't take advantage of that gift, you might as well stop right there in chapter in verse 17, where God says, this, and everything that is in the earth shall die. That might as well be it for you. If you don't want to accept the gift, if you don't think the gift is valuable to you, that's where it can end for you. But that wasn't good enough for me. I thought, no, 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 I want to take advantage of verse number 18. I want to be part of that covenant. I want to be in there. I want to take advantage of that. I want to be saved from that death and destruction. I want to take advantage of that grace. And so, if you don't have that grace, if you have, an, you have, you have the grace, it's been given to you. If you have an advantage of the gift of that, I beg you tonight, do it. There's no time like the present. But the second part of that is if you have taken advantage of that gift, if you have accepted that, if you have got on the ark, if you have got on the boat, metaphorically speaking, obviously, quit trying to drive. 
Quit trying to be in control. Quit trying to navigate. There's no navigational devices here that we see. We don't see any of those things because God didn't intend for that. God intended for us to follow the instructions. And He laid them out plain as day. Just like He gave Noah all the instructions here, told him what to build with, told him how to build it, told him how big to build it. He gave him all the instructions. He gave us all the instructions too. And, he, and Noah, he followed the instructions, and then he trusted God. He followed the instructions, and he trusted God. It was that simple for him. And you know what? You might be thinking to yourself, well, Brother Owen, there's, you don't know. There, there's things that come up in my life that no one has ever faced before. Doubt it. Probably not. There's a lot of people been born before you. going to be a lot of people born after you. The fact is, God wrote, God wrote His Word with us in mind. He wrote it. He wrote it. It was settled in heaven years and years and years ago. Before time even existed, it was settled in heaven. And you know what? It still applies to us today. The instructions are just as good, but they're useless if we don't trust God. That's all I've got. That's it. It's simple tonight. Trust God. Get on the boat. Quit trying to drive. That's it. Fully rely on God. You can't do any better than that. If you find yourself following instructions and trusting God, you have the essence of the victorious Christian life. There's no need to overcomplicate it. There's no need to, to, to try and work your way through all of the, the different levels of, of this. And man, I don't understand what the third big toe on the statue in the book of Daniel meant. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. There's a lot of good things in the Bible to study and learn about that can make us stronger and better Christians. And those will all come in time if we follow the instructions and trust God. Let's pray. God, I thank you for tonight.